Wir sind hier im Kulturzentrum Ringlockschuppen in Mülheim an der Ruhr. Herzlich willkommen, Richard Dawkins. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir dieses Gespräch mit Ihnen führen können. Sie werden hier heute Abend Ihr neuestes Buch vorstellen. Ihr Buch heißt Die Schöpfungslüge. In diesem Buch tragen Sie alle wissenschaftlichen Belege ganz minutiös zusammen, die Belege für die Evolutionstheorie nach Darwin. Wie ich von diesem Buch gehört habe, war so spontan mein erster Gedanke, wozu dieser Aufwand? Also wer bestreitet denn heutzutage noch ernsthaft die Evolutionstheorie? Deshalb meine Frage an Sie, was war die Motivation für dieses Buch? In a country like Switzerland, you probably don't need it, but in the United States of America, it is important because more than 40% of the American population not only doubt evolution, but actually think the world is young, actually think the world is only about 6,000 years old. Now, that's a very, very big error. So there is an important reason to write a book like that, purely from a critical point of view. But I don't want to be too critical because I want to say that the evidence for evolution is just enthralling and thrilling and exciting in its own right. And so mostly I want the book to be seen as a positive book. And so it should, it should be enjoyed by people, even if they already agree with it. Mm. They should enjoy it and maybe I hope they'll learn something from it as well. Mm. Also, dass man das Buch genießen kann, das kann ich bestätigen. Es, es zeigt wirklich die wissenschaftlichen Erkenntnisse auf, auf eine Art, wie man sie auch als Laie versteht. Sie haben jetzt gesagt, über 40 Prozent in den USA sind Kreationisten in dem Fall. That figure goes back to the 1980s. It's a fairly consistent figure. It varies 40, 41, 44, 45. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a fairly um, consistent figure. It has political significance, I think. I mean, people identify their fundamentalist religion with their right-wing politics, which again is a thing we're not really very familiar with in Europe. Hmm. Sie haben am, am Ende des Buches auch Tabellen drin, da habe ich dann schon gestaunt und habe dann doch merken müssen, wahrscheinlich braucht es das Buch doch, wo Sie Umfragen zitieren. Einfach als ein Beispiel, es wurden Umfragen gemacht, ob die Leute dem Satz zustimmen, die Menschen, wie wir sie heute kennen, haben sich aus älteren Tierarten entwickelt. Da sagen in Großbritannien, also wo Sie herkommen, 79 Prozent sagen, ja, das stimmt. 13 Prozent bestreiten das, 8 Prozent sagen, Sie wissen es nicht. In Deutschland 69 Prozent sagen, ja, 23 Prozent sagen, nein, das stimmt nicht. Also Menschen haben sich nicht aus älteren Tierarten entwickelt, 8 Prozent wissen es nicht. Und jetzt in der Schweiz sind wir im unteren Drittel, ich habe wirklich gestaunt, 62 Prozent nur sagen, ja, das stimmt. In der Türkei sind es gar nur noch 27 Prozent, also offensichtlich. Ich habe wirklich gestaunt, weil ich gedacht habe, heutzutage, das hat sich doch durchgesetzt, diese Meinung. Ähm, sind es denn vor allen Dingen christlich-evangelikale, die ähm, die Evolutionslehre immer noch bestreiten? The figure from Switzerland that you quote is, of course, um, slightly less good than in other parts, of in Scandinavia, for example, but mm. it's still a lot better than in the United States and a lot better than in Turkey. You'd expect it for Turkey, an Islamic uh, mm. country. Um, I don't know whether, I think it mostly is religion, yes, although if you look at some other figures in the same survey that you quote, uh, in Britain, for example, I think it's something like 19% think it takes one month for the Earth to orbit the Sun. Um, and I think mm. it's 27% who think that humans coexisted with dinosaurs. So this is a general ignorance of science. Mm -hmm. I think it's not only driven by fundamentalist religion. Mm -hmm. Da müsste man sich wahrscheinlich die Frage stellen, was macht man da falsch, auch in der Schule, dass offensichtlich naturwissenschaftliche Kenntnisse sich nicht besser verbreiten. Aber bevor wir jetzt hier weiter diskutieren, möchte ich ähm, ganz kurz unterbrechen. Wir haben einen kleinen Filmeinspieler vorbereitet und den schauen wir uns jetzt an. Am Anfang war nichts. Und irgendwann wurde was. Nur wann, wo und vor allem wie. Darüber streiten Wissenschaftler seit Generationen. So auch der Evolutionsbiologe Richard Dawkins in seinem neuesten Buch Die Schöpfungslüge. 
Basierend auf Charles Darwins berühmtem Werk »Die Entstehung der Arten« spricht er vom egoistischen Gen als dem Motor der natürlichen Selektion. Der stärkere, bessere, intelligentere setzt sich durch. Und so entsteht vielfältiges und immer komplexeres Leben. Aber die Evolution hat kein höheres Ziel. Hinter ihr steht kein intelligentes Design. Und deshalb kann es für den streitbaren Atheisten Dawkins auch keinen Gott geben. Man kann nicht wirklich beweisen, dass etwas nicht existiert. Aber es gibt viele Sachen, von denen wir nicht glauben, dass es sie gibt, obwohl wir das auch nicht beweisen können. Wie Einhörner, Feen, Kobolde. Gott ist auch so. Wir können nicht beweisen, dass es ihn nicht gibt. Aber das macht ihn trotzdem nicht sehr wahrscheinlich. Vor drei Jahren erschien Richard Dawkins Bestseller »Der Gotteswahn«. Darin bestreitet er nicht nur die Existenz Gottes, sondern er bezeichnet Religion als kulturelles Konstrukt, das sich wie ein schädliches Virus verbreitet und in den Köpfen der Menschen festsetzt. Dagegen kämpft Dawkins an, als Wissenschaftler und als Staatsbürger. Ja, Richard Dawkins, Sie gehören zweifellos zu den schärfsten Religionskritikern der Gegenwart. Was hat Sie zu dieser Haltung gebracht? Haben Sie so schlechte Erfahrungen gemacht mit Religion? No, I, I mean I was brought up in um, a free thinking household and I was sent to Anglican schools, but the Anglican religion is a very benign form of the virus. It's not a it's not a malignant form. Um, so no, I I couldn't say that I had religion thrust down my throat. I I care passionately about the truth. Mm. And I think that the scientific truth is beautiful. By the way, to pick up on something that you said before the break, um, mm. I think that science education does have a lot to answer for. And I think we do need to um, make science more exciting to children, um, perhaps less of a sort of school textbook subject. Look at the, how thrilling science is. Look at, the, look at the wonder of science. That was always what, what motivated me. It is so exciting to understand mm. how the universe really works. And in the 21st century, in the 20th century, we really do have the chance to do that. And so the little tin pot idea of the universe that was fed to us as in our religious education, it's just so paltry, so small, so, so demeaning. That's what really got me about it. Hmm. Aber glauben Sie denn, dass Naturwissenschaft alle Fragen klären kann? I do not think that scientists can answer all questions, but I don't think anybody else can. Mm -hmm. Und es könnte auch nicht sein, dass sich verschiedene ähm, Perspektiven, zum Beispiel die naturwissenschaftliche und die, ich sage jetzt religiöse oder die philosophische, die sich ergänzen, dass die ja. vielleicht zusammen dann mehr erklären können, als es eine Wissenschaft allein kann. No, I think that there are plenty of other perspectives that do give illumination, a poetic perspective, a literary perspective, a historical perspective, a, histori a, a sociological perspective. Religious perse perspective, it seems to me, has absolutely nothing mm. to contribute. Wie wurde denn in Ihrer Familie umgegangen mit Religion? Uh, my family were never particularly interested in religion. Um, I was nominally brought up in the Anglican Church, but that means nothing really. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, I went to Anglican schools, went to chapel every Sunday. Um, but as I said, that is a benign form of the virus. Mm. Es gab nicht irgendein Schlüsselerlebnis, was Sie dazu gebracht hätte, jetzt Atheist zu werden. Das hat sich irgendwie langsam verfestigt. No, I would say there were a couple of key moments, maybe a key moment in a, when I was about nine, when I realized, I think talking to my mother, that there are lots of different religions and the Christi Christianity that I was brought up with was only one of many. Yeah. So it immediately became obvious to me that if I'd been brought up in a different country, my religion would have been different. And so that shook my confidence in the religion that I was brought up in. Um, but, but then I reverted to a kind of deism, where I thought, well, there must be some creator of all this wonderful complexity of life. And uh, I persisted with that and was even confirmed in the Church of England at the age of 13. But then at the age of about 15 or 16, uh, I rather abruptly realized that Darwinian evolution does explain all the beauty, the complexity, the elegance of life. And that was a rather sudden um, loss of religion for me. At that point, I lost religion completely. Mm -hmm. um, 
Warum haben Sie dann gerade Biologie studiert? Was hat Sie an diesem Fach fasziniert? Well, I became fascinated by biology long after I started studying it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really until my second year at the university at Oxford that I became truly hooked on biology. Uh, I drifted into it at school pretty much um, it, the word drift is about right. I mean, my father had read botany at Oxford, and so I kind of followed in his footsteps. But I was a rather late developer as far as getting a real enthusiasm for biology is concerned, not until university. Mm -hmm. Aber was Sie daran fasziniert, ist schon, dass, dass man vieles erklären kann, wie die Welt funktioniert. Precisely. I was never much of a naturalist. Most of my most of my friends and colleagues got into biology through being bird watchers or bug hunters and or flower collectors, as my father was. But no, I was always more interested in the philosophical questions of why do we exist? Where does life come from? What's it all about? What's it all for? And so yes, that that was what um, it still does interest me in biology. Gerade diese Fragen, die Sie jetzt nennen, sind ja eigentlich die klassischen philosophischen und auch religiösen Fragen. Also warum existieren wir überhaupt? Wie kann eine naturwissenschaftliche Disziplin auf so eine Frage eine Antwort geben? Science gives an answer to these deep questions, um, especially the biological part, especially the, the Darwinian answers that we can give to questions like why do we exist? Why do humans exist? Mm -hmm. um, we exist because our ancestors existed, and our ancestors existed because they existed. And we understand why. We understand what the driving force was that caused life to become ever more complicated and ever more suffused with an illusion of design. That's what's so striking about life. Unlike rocks and mountains and rivers and beaches, mm -hmm. Living things look as though somebody designed them. They look very strongly as though someone has designed them. And yet there's no designer. Mm. That's what's so fascinating about what Darwin did. Darwin took what must have seemed, and he did seem, to everybody as being overwhelmingly laden down with the idea of design. Darwin showed that it wasn't. Mm. Das klärt aber noch nicht die Frage, warum es überhaupt etwas gibt. Also, wenn die, die Sache mal beginnt mit der Evolution, klar, dann kann man das erklären. Aber warum es überhaupt ein Universum gibt, warum es Materie gibt? You push the question back to why the universe exists, which is beyond my area of competence. That's a question for a physicist. And if you had uh, Stephen Hawking or Roger Penrose here, you would be asking them that question. So I have to give an answer, which is that of an amateur, that, that of a a professional biologist, but an amateur in mm. physics. Why the universe exists, it's a much more difficult question, I think. I suspect that physicists are less far advanced in answering their deep question than biologists are, because the, the deep question of physicists is, is a deeper question. Mm. But my understanding is that physicists are closing in on that answer, and that they understand pretty much everything after the first picosecond mm. of the universe. Um, but that the very origins of the universe itself are still a bit of a mystery, which, which, they're, which they're working on. What I can say, and I don't need to be a physicist to say this, what I can say is that however difficult the question of the origin of the universe may be, it is most certainly not going to be helped by postulating some kind of cosmic designer. That mm. won't help at all. Mm. Es macht ja wahrscheinlich wirklich auch keinen Sinn, dass man einfach alle Lücken, die es noch gibt in Erklärungen, dann mit, mit Religion füllt. Da gebe ich Ihnen durchaus recht. Ähm, trotzdem, können Sie ähm, noch etwas detaillierter Ihre Hauptkritikpunkte an Religion erläutern? Und wenn ich Sie richtig verstehe, bezieht sich diese Kritik ja nicht nur aufs Christentum, sondern auf Religion überhaupt, egal in welcher Ausformung. I think that religion should be criticized on intellectual grounds as providing a competitor to the scientific explanation of life and the universe. It's educationally pernicious because it gives the idea that you can uh, evade the responsibility to understand things by postulating some sort of easy explanation, oh, God did it. I think that's educationally pernicious. And as a scientist and, and as an educator, I'm most interested in that.
However, there are other problems with religion as well. The idea of the idea of faith, the idea of believing something without any e evidence, the idea of believing something without any evidence, tends to make people prepared to do terrible things in the name of their God because they believe that their God wants them to be a martyr and they'll go straight to paradise if they do. There's only a minority of them who do that, only an extreme minority. But if the majority of children are brought up to believe that there's some virtue in faith, that there's some virtue in believing something without any evidence, then it will only take a minority to take that really seriously. In a sense, the suicide bombers are the ones who really, really take their religion seriously. Mm. And the gentle ones who don't, who don't do suicide bombing, they're the ones who don't really take it seriously. But as Sam Harris has said, these people really believe what they say they believe. And they believe it without evidence. And if you believe something without evidence, and if you're taught that it's a virtue to believe something without evidence, then there's no argument that can sway you. Because I can't come along and say, look, I think you're wrong about this because. Mm. They say, no, 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 stuff fingers in ears. I've been taught. This is faith. You can't touch my faith. Mm. But I think kein Theologe or kein vernünftiger um, Priester oder überhaupt kein vernünftiger, auch gläubiger Mensch würde sagen, meine Religion befiehlt mir, ähm, andere umzubringen. Also das ist doch eine, ein total falsches Verständnis von Religion, was eben auch missbraucht wird. Of course theologians don't do that, but how many theologians have any power? The point is the vast majority of religious people are not theologians. Moreover, theologians speak with a different voice when they're talking to other theologians or talking to intellectuals than when they stand up in a pulpit. Um, a, a simple il illustration of that is uh, an awful lot of people out in the churches believe literally in the story of Adam and Eve. Mm. Now, of course, theologians don't believe in the story of Adam and Eve, but you'd never know that to listen to them preaching. They use the language of Adam and Eve as an allegory, as a, as a metaphor. Mm. They don't tell the congregation it's only an allegory or a metaphor. That's an aside. The important point is that, as I said before, it only takes a minority of people to take their religion really seriously. I know theologians don't take their religion re really seriously. I know theologians don't go and bomb and kill. But they teach children that faith is a virtue. They teach children that you don't need evidence for your beliefs. They teach children that it's a good thing to have faith. If they teach children that there will be tempters who will come along and try to sway you by reason and you should ignore them. So theologians are harmless. The vast majority of religious people are harmless, but they provide a climate in which it is safe for the fundamentalist fanatics To thrive. Aber denken Sie denn, wenn es jetzt keine Religion gäbe, obwohl das ist eine obsolete Frage, aber trotzdem, wenn es keine Religion gäbe, dann gäbe es keine Selbstmordbomber. Ähm, ich glaube, es gibt immer Fanatiker und die würden halt einen anderen Grund finden. Und Religion wird doch oft politisch auch missbraucht. Religionskriege sind oft auch eigentlich im Kern politische Konflikte, ähm, territoriale Konflikte. Es, glauben Sie wirklich, dass wenn wir jetzt keine Religion hätten, dass es all das dann nicht gäbe? There are other reasons than religion to be fanatical. There's fanatical patriotism, for example, which we saw in the Japanese in the Second World War, in the Germans in the Second World War, in the British in the Second World War, and in the First World War. Um, so yes, it is possible to motivate people to do terrible things. Um, if you have some kind of fundamental belief in something, some ideal, some political ideal, it might be Marxism, it might be National Socialism, it might be patriotism, it might be the honor of the emperor. There, there are other things than religion. But religion is a remarkable powerful one because religion actually teaches that you don't have to justify your beliefs they're just faith they're just justified by themselves and uh, so I think if you're asking me would the world be a better place without religion I would unequivocally say yes if you're asking me would there be no fanatical fundamentalisms without religion the answer is no there would be because we do have fundamental patriotism fundamental 
uh, Marxism etc. Sie bezeichnen ja Religion als Virus. Vielleicht müssen Sie das noch erklären. Halten Sie alle religiösen Menschen für krank? I think it's, uh, the virus is quite a good analogy in one respect. A virus is something that spreads because it spreads because it spreads. So if you look biologically at what a virus does, um, it, it's, it's made of DNA, or sometimes RNA. It contains instructions that don't say something interesting like the DNA of an elephant that says build a trunk. Um, well, the, strictly speaking, you could say the DNA of an elephant says build a trunk and build legs and build a tail and build ears, all in the service of making more DNA like this. That's what it's all about. So any DNA is in a sense saying make more DNA like me. Mm -hmm. But in the case of an elephant, using this rather large digression of making a trunk and legs and eyes and, and so on. In the case of a virus, the digression is much shorter. In case of a virus, it's just more or less copy me, copy me, copy me, make a duplicate of me, replicate me, spread me around. Now, any idea which passes from brain to brain and says copy me is like a virus. So an example of a, of a mind virus would be one of those so-called chain letters that you get. You know you get a letter that says, make six copies of this, this letter and pass them on to six friends. Well, not all the six friends are going to do that, but it only takes a minority and it will spread. And so we've all received these letters. Uh, they are pointless, they're, they're a waste of time. Sometimes they contain little bribes. They say, if you make six copies of this letter, then you'll, then you'll re receive 10 euros from each person or whatever it is. Um, or sometimes they say, if you don't mm -hmm. make six copies, then you'll have a terrible catastrophe in your, in your life. It only takes a minority of people to believe that, and it will spread. That's a mind virus. I think religion is like that, because I think religion contains messages of reassurance, you'll go to heaven if you believe, or it contains threats, you'll go to hell if you don't. It, all it takes is for a message like that to have some appeal or some threat that amounts to an appeal, which will cause it to spread. And some things spread better than others. Advertising people are in the business of thinking up viruses that will spread. People talk about YouTube videos going viral. Mm. They spread because they spread because they spread. Uh, and I think that religion belongs in that category. Religious ideas belong in that category. And well-organized religions like Roman Catholicism and Islam are collections of mind viruses which thrive in each other's presence. Aber könnte man nicht auch sagen, die Tatsache, dass sich Religion über die Jahrtausende einfach immer hält und die allermeisten Menschen eben im Moment noch jedenfalls doch irgendwie religiös sind, egal wie, dass man sagen müsste, ja offensichtlich dient das irgendwie der menschlichen Evolution, weil warum gäbe es sie sonst noch? You wouldn't have to say that it helps hu humans in any way. What you could have to say is that it helps itself. Um, any, any idea which, um, which is um, appealing, which, which spreads because it spreads, will spread. And whether or not it helps humans is a quite separate issue. I would say that, that those religions that have survived, like Christianity in, in all its various forms, and, uh, Roman Catholicism, Lutheranism, etc., and um, Islam, Sunni Islam, um, Shia Islam, and so on, These are with us because they're very good at spreading. I mean, just like rabies, just like, just like um, measles, these are highly successful viruses. And that's why they spread. But it doesn't mean they're good for us. Measles is not good for us. Chickenpox is not good for us. Rabies is not good for us. But they do spread. But does that mean that there are in the evolution different things that are schädlich und trotzdem halten die sich, obwohl die der Evolution nicht dienen, im Gegenteil, obwohl die sogar abträglich sind. Also man hat immer so die Vorstellung, dass sich das Schlechte dann irgendwann mal ähm, aussortiert. It depends who they're bad for. Remember that what we're talking about is natural selection in the interests of whatever happens to be being selected. So viruses are good for viruses, they're not good for humans. Um, much of what we do as humans is good for humans. Much of what lions do as lions is good for themselves as lions. But 
there's a competition going on in the world. There are lots of different strands of DNA all evolving at the same time, and they have different interests. L lions prosper at the expense of antelopes. Antelopes prosper at the expense of lions. Um, viruses prosper at the expense of their victims. And so you cannot say just good for evolution. There's no such thing as good for evolution. You have to say good for this particular interest group, mm. which in the case of viruses has very different interests from the interests of humans. Aber ich meine, es ist doch nicht zu bestreiten, dass Religion oder auch die Zugehörigkeit zu einer religiösen Gemeinschaft für viele Menschen eine Stütze im Leben darstellt. Das Ihnen das hilft, ihr Leben zu bewältigen. Was ist da so schlecht dran? Well, that's very likely true. Uh, that there very probably is, a, is an element of support in, in, in religion. That, that's a different point that you're now making. And it's a small point, it's a minor point. Uh, and it's possible that some people do obtain some sort of consolation from religion. Other people obtain a consolation from drugs, for, for example. Mm. Um, whether you think that's a good thing is up to you. And I don't want to say one way or the other, but I accept that it might be true. Other people obtain the very reverse of consolation from religion, and people who are terrified out of their wits by the threat of hell, for example. And I get lots and lots of letters, mostly from Roman Catholics, actually, mm. um, saying that they were brought up Catholic, and they may even have given up their religion, but they still can't quite shake off that awful, appalling childhood indoctrination when they were told they would roast forever in hell. People are genuinely scared of that. That's not consoling. Mm. But in any case, even if religion is consoling, it doesn't make it true. Ich meine, die Frage ist doch, wie bewältigen Menschen ihr Leben? Und jeder muss auf irgendeine Art und Weise sein Leben bewältigen. Und ich kenne einfach viele Leute, die die sind nicht traumatisiert von Religion, die haben auch eine, eine, eine sehr offene Art von Religion. Ähm, aber die sagen, das gibt mir einen Halt im Leben. O oder zum Beispiel Menschen, die Schicksalsschläge, einfach sagen wir den Tod von ähm, Angehörigen, sie können das besser akzeptieren, sie, sie können besser mit dem umgehen. Und da frage ich mich einfach, warum soll man das denn den Menschen nehmen? Ich meine, ich, ich fokussiere jetzt auf die positiven Effekte, wo Sie selber sagen, ja, die, die mag es geben. Also warum das, das Kind mit dem Bade ausschütten? Uh, I mean, that's fine, if they, if they take comfort from it, by all means, I, I, mm. I care about what's true. I mean, people take comfort from heroin, and, um, you know, <laughs> if, if they do, who, who am I to take it away from them? Um, I, I'm not really talking about that, I, mm. I care about what's true. Uh, and I, I don't think that to say that people get, get comfort from religion is a very powerful argument in its favor, any, any more than, than saying people get comfort from heroin. But in any case, why are we talking about religion when mm. my book, um, I forget, sorry, the German title has escaped me, um, uh, the, great, the Greatest Show on Earth, <laughs> yeah. uh, is not about religion, it's about creationism and evolution. Genau, aber Ihr Buch, Ihr Buch vorher, Der Gotteswand, das hat ja auch eine sehr, sehr große um, um, Diskussion ausgelöst. Oh, the God delusion, certainly, but genau. we're not talking about the God delusion. <laughs> Können wir aber ja jetzt machen. Um, yeah. Einmal mehr, wenn Sie sagen, der Gotteswahn. Wahn ist ja eigentlich eine psychiatrische Kategorie. Also nochmals, sind für Sie um, religiöse Menschen doch irgendwie um, psychisch krank? No, I don't think they're mentally ill because there are so many of them and it, one wouldn't w normally want to use the word mentally ill of a large number of people. What I would say is that if only one person suddenly announced that he believed that some uh, first century Jew turned water into wine, walked on water and rose from the dead, if he was the only person who said that, we would say he was mad. Mm. Uh, and so uh, it's the, the only way of, ex of excusing the God delusion as not being mental, a mental illness, is to say that it's an extremely widespread um, delusion. And therefore, um, it doesn't really qualify in the same way as people who think they're Napoleon. But actually, if you look objectively at the belief on the one hand, I think I'm Napoleon, and on the other hand, I think that a first century Jew walked on water and turned water into wine, both those are equally deluded, both equally absurd. But genau da macht man Ihnen ja immer wieder den Vorwurf, 
das haben Sie vorhin angesprochen, Sie nehmen die Bibel selber wörtlich. Also Sie sagen jetzt ja, wenn einer übers Wasser ging. Dann kommen die Theologen und sagen, ja, das muss man ja gar nicht wörtlich verstehen. Ich meine, jeder weiß, dass man nicht über Wasser gehen kann. Ähm, also dieser Vorwurf, den hören Sie ja oft, dass man Ihnen sagt, ja, Sie nehmen die Bibel ja selber wörtlich. Obwohl Sie, Sie wissen, es gibt ähm, die historisch-kritische Bibellektüre. Was halten Sie denn davon? As I said earlier, there are the majority of Christian believers do take it literally and I know theologians don't and I've said that before as for theologians how do they decide which bits to take literally and which bits not to take literally they cherry-pick they say oh I like that verse okay that verse will have will have that one. no we won't have that one I don't like that one. we'll have that one that one how do you decide which bits to take and how does your poor congregation know which bits to decide do you wait for the priest to stand up in the pulpit and say, well, you can ignore verse 32 and 33 because we've decided they're not true anymore, but verse 34 is pretty good. The majority of people, as I say, the majority of Christians do believe that Jesus turned water into wine, do believe that Jesus arose from the, from the dead. There may be sophisticated theologians who don't. I would like to ask them, how do you decide? The answer to, is usually that they actually don't really believe it at all. Also Sie meinen, dass die überhaupt nicht in die Bibel glauben? I'm saying that they, 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 they cherry pick which bits to, to, to call metaphorical and which bits to take, to take literally. And how is their wretched congregation supposed to know? Mm. Gut, aber dann müsste man sagen, das ist eine Kritik um, an, an die Theologen. Also die schaffen es offenbar nicht, um, das zu kommunizieren. Ich, ich würde trotzdem, ich würde das in Zweifel ziehen, dass die meisten... Leute, wie Sie sagen, die Bibel wörtlich nehmen. Ähm, selbst wenn das stimmt, ich meine, die, die sie nicht wörtlich nehmen, die haben offenbar gelernt, dass man biblische Texte historisch einordnen muss, dass man sie in aller Regel, würde ich eben sagen, nicht wörtlich, sondern metaphorisch versteht. Sie sagen jetzt, ja, wo wissen wir welche Stellen? Wir können es ja, ähm, warum kann man es nicht generell mal versuchen, dieses Buch als ein metaphorisches Buch? Zum Beispiel, wie gehen wir mit griechischen Mythen um? Die nehmen wir ja auch nicht wörtlich. Und trotzdem lesen wir aus, aus der Geschichte von Oedipus oder von Prometheus oder wie sie alle heißen, wir lesen da gewisse metaphorische Dinge raus, die wir sagen, die haben doch heute noch eine Bedeutung, aber nicht eine wörtliche Bedeutung. Warum kann man das mit der Bibel nicht auch so machen? That would be fine, and if only people did that. But, but, um, aber das machen die doch. Well, you quoted even in Switzerland, you said that only 60% of people... Um, Aber das ist nicht die Mehrheit. Yeah. <laughs> Sie sagen immer die in America, meisten. In America, it's... No, I mean, uh, the, it, it is true that you can, you can cherry-pick your Christians. You can find Christians who actually don't believe a word of it, but think, oh, it's rather a pretty myth. There are other Christians who take it very, very literally indeed. Um, my book, The Greatest Show on Earth, is, takes off from the point that there are at least 40% of the American people who not only take it literally, but think the world is less than 10,000 years mm. old. I mean, that's a very serious delusion, and it's 40% mm. of the American people. Now, I'm actually not that interested in theologians who say, oh, we only believe that symbolically. I'm not interested in that. I accept that there are, um, there's a certain uh, beauty in the Greek myths, and that, that's fine, and nobody takes them literally. One can do the same thing of the Christian myths. It is actually quite surprising how many uh, Christians, even those who call themselves theolo serious theologians, who believe, say, in the virgin birth. Just absolutely no um, historical verification whatever, but they do take it seriously. The majority of theologians believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Quite a few of them believe even other miracles like um, turning water into wine. But even if they don't, I don't really care if they choose to cherry pick this verse or that verse. The majority of their congregation are not told and not um, clearly guided as to which bits are metaphorical and which bits are not. Even the bits that are metaphorical, they're not really very good metaphors, are they? I mean, the, for example, the truly hideous story of Abraham uh, um, sacrificing Isaac and just stopping at the last minute. Now, for the great majority of history, people have believed that, and many people still do believe it as, fa as fact. I bet that 40% of the American people believe mm. it, for example, no question. 
The sophisticated theologians say, oh, it's an allegory, it's a parable, uh, it's a metaphor. It was teaching the Jews that they should stop sacrificing humans and sacrifice sheep instead. It's pretty unpleasant sacrificing sheep, actually. But anyway, let, setting that on one, one side. If you want to tell people to stop sacrificing humans and, and sacrifice sheep instead, why not just tell them? Why dress it up in this truly hideous story of child abuse uh, by Abraham against his son Isaac? What is the point of a myth like that? Naja, Sie wissen ja vielleicht nicht, wie Leuchte funktioniert haben im, zu dieser Zeit. Also vielleicht hat man da wirklich, ich, ich fantasiere jetzt etwas, vielleicht hat man da wirklich mit Mythen, ähm, war das die Art, wie man gewisse Dinge den Leuten gesagt hat. Das könnte doch sein. Also ich meine, wir gehen natürlich auch immer von unserer heutigen Zeit aus und sagen, ja damals, wie konnte man? Ist wahrscheinlich bei vielen Dingen so, dass man sie eben darum sagt, ja, dass man sie eben auch im Entstehungskontext ähm, lesen muss. Aber gut, lassen wir... And, well, yeah. and, and may I just answer that? Okay. Um, um, and and that, that's true, and the same is true of Greek myths, the same is true of the, of the myths of the Vikings, the Norsemen. These are all to, to be taken as myths and studied mm -hmm. as a part of anthropology, as a part of, of, of racial psychology or, or something of that sort. But to an enormous number of people, the Bible or the Quran is treated as sacred text. Mm -hmm. And priests and theologians really ought to come right out and say, this is not fact. This, at best it's allegory, at best it's no better than the Greek myths and the Norse myths. Read them all together, study them all together as myths, mm -hmm. but that's not what they do. Mm. They give the impression to innocent people who don't know better, they give the impression that there is something special about this book, the Bible, or in the case of the Muslim world, this book, the Quran. You cannot pretend that it's just like the, the Greek myths. They are treated as special. Mm -hmm. The Gideon Bible is in every hotel room. Why aren't the Greek myths in every hotel room? There really is a difference in people's minds and that includes the minds of so-called sophisticated theologians. Mm -hmm. Es gibt es ja auch viele Leute, die sagen, und das hören sie auch ständig, um, wenn man keine Religion hat, dann wenn man alles naturalistisch, mechanistisch versteht, der Mensch als ein Bioautomat, als ein ähm, zufällig kosmologisch unbedeutendes Randphänomen in einem sinnleeren Universum, dann gibt es keinen metaphysischen, keinen vorgegebenen Sinn. Und jeder muss sich eben seinen Lebenssinn selber finden. Ist das vielleicht eine Überforderung für gewisse Menschen? Um, well, if you mean that um too much for certain people. That's a sort of patronizing view of certain people. Um, uh, I think that the, it would be very wrong to use a word like just or only a naturalistic view. A naturalistic view is wonderful. Hmm. A naturalistic view is poetic. Uh, we are enormously privileged to, to have come into existence in this universe with brains capable of understanding it, capable too of doing poetry, of doing philosophy, of doing mathematics, of doing great literature, we must not demean it by suggesting that the only alternative uh, to a sort of um, dry, dull, um, automaton view is, is religion. Religion absolutely isn't. You, you can be poeti a poetic scientist, you can be an inspired scientist, uh, you can be a musical scientist, you can be a loving scientist. You do not have to have religion. Religion is um, ancient superstition, which doesn't help. It should be studied as an ancient superstition and not treated as seriously or as respectfully as it now is. But as I've said already, this is all relevant to my previous book and not this book. Sie haben ja bei dieser um, atheistischen Buskampagne damals auch mitgemacht. Man hat es im Einspieler ganz kurz gesehen. Ähm, da war ja das Motto, ähm, es gibt wahrscheinlich keinen Gott, also hör auf, dir Sorgen zu machen und genieße das Leben. Ich habe mich dann gefragt, ist es nicht geradezu zynisch, wenn man gewissen Menschen sagt, genieße das Leben? Ich stelle mir jetzt vor, ein 30-jähriger Mann, der gerade die Diagnose Hirntumor bekommen hat, oder eine Mutter, der gerade das Kind gestorben ist, also, ist das nicht schwierig, dann einfach so als Lebensmutter zu sagen, genieß dein Leben? Yes, I wasn't responsible for the, for the slogan. I, I, I was part of the committee. Aber Sie haben mitgemacht. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, 
Of course you can produce sob stories about people dying of cancer and of course it doesn't help pe people like that. that you, when you're trying to make a, a slogan for a bus, you've got to make it brief. Um, that the meaning of that slogan, as I understand it from the people who, who devised it, was um, not just enjoy your life, but live life to the full. Take life fully. Don't obsess about the afterlife because there isn't going to be any afterlife. Concentrate on this life and make the best of it as you can. If you're dying of cancer, then make the best of that if you can, and that's very difficult. Of course it is, but religion isn't going to help you. Let's live our lives properly and fully and with open eyes and courageously open eyes. Once again, I repeat, this is nothing to do with The Greatest Show on Earth. You're interviewing me about my previous book, which was published four years ago. But I think you are also famous as this very strong religious critic, which you now here show. And I wanted to ask some things to ask. Okay, let's talk about the God delusion and forget about the greatest show on earth. <laughs> Nein, das They're haben wir nicht vergessen. In German and I'm entirely happy. Genau, also das, die deutsche Version ist gerade rausgekommen. Das haben wahrscheinlich noch viele Leute noch gar nicht gelesen. Um, was auch in, in Gottes Wahn besprochen wird, die Frage, wie man denn eigentlich Ethik begründet ohne Religion. Viele Leute sagen, ja, wenn ohne Religion kann man kein guter Mensch sein. Das ist natürlich Quatsch. Trotzdem glaube ich, es ist gar nicht einfach, ähm, Moral und Ethik zu begründen, wenn man sie nicht in etwas Absolutem festmachen kann. Also wo, was legitimiert dann die Begründung? I think it's an astonishing suggestion that um you can get morals from religion. If you think about where your morals come from, if you're religious, do your morals come from the Bible? Do your morals include stoning people to death for adultery, stoning people to death for breaking the Sabbath? Do your morals include uh, killing children who are cheeky to their parents? Uh, do your morals include sacrificing people? Um, the the, the, the Bible and the Quran would be appalling sources of, of morality. Now, it is true, as I said before about cherry picking, that as you look through the Bible, you can find verses that accord with our modern moral sense. You can find verses that um, are in favor of slavery, and you can find verses that are against slavery. Um, so you can pick the ones that are against slavery and reject the ones that are in favor of slavery. You can even find verses that say, that say nice things about women, although it's quite hard to do. You can find a much larger number of verses in both the Bible and the Quran which give women a very hard time. So if you're prepared to go through the Bible and pick the verses you like, then you can find an adequate moral scheme. But how do you pick those verses? Mm. On non-biblical grounds. You pick those verses on grounds of a, mor of a modern ethic which we all share, whether we're religious or not, which has developed gradually over centuries and over decades so that nowadays we don't accept slavery. Nowadays we respect women. Switzerland gave the vote to women, I think, as late as the 1970s, which is an utter disgrace. Um, but that too has been a, a shifting moral zeitgeist, which has been happening irrespective of religion. By the way, Britain only gave the vote to, the, to, to women in the 1920s, which is pretty bad too. Um, so we do not, as a matter of fact, get our morals, get our ethics from the Bible. We get it from somewhere else, and I agree with you, it's quite difficult to decide where we get it from, but wherever it is, it certainly isn't the Bible. Now, there's another way in which you might develop your morals from, from religion, which would be the carrot and stick, the threat of hell and the hope of heaven. I've even met people who say, if I wasn't religious, I would go out and kill my neighbor. Why shouldn't I do that? If I have no absolute morality, why shouldn't I do that? What an appalling reason to be moral, to be, to be frightened of the great spy camera in the sky that's taking photographs of everything that you do. I and other atheists like me are no less moral, possibly no more moral, than anybody else. And if we're moral, we're moral not because we're frightened of going to hell, 
or because we hope to go to heaven, but because we have some better reason to be moral. I agree with you, it's difficult to find mm -hmm. where that better reason comes from, but wherever it is, it most certainly is not the Bible. Mm -hmm. Wherever it is, it's something that we all share and which changes from decade to decade. As I said, votes for women is something that arose in the 20th century and bizarrely, but not before that, except in New Zealand, I think, um, slavery was once accepted as totally normal, with biblical sanction, by the way. Slavery was abolished with some religious help and some non-religious help as well. We've shifted our moral zeitgeist. It moves with the times. We move with the times. And we don't get it from religion. Wherever we get it from, it's not religion. The hmm. question is, um, also, was wären denn zum Beispiel wirklich Werte, die absolut gelten? Wie bestimmt man das? Ähm, macht man das demokratisch? Die, die Mehrheit ist dafür, dass Personenwürde ein Wert ist. So, Wie macht man das? Also, it's a very difficult question, as I've said, but it's mm. not up to me to answer it. It's up to you to answer it as well. It's up to all of us to answer it. It's mm. up to religious people to answer it. What I've demonstrated is that it doesn't come yeah. from religion. So we all have to sit down together mm -hmm. and try to work out where it does come from. Now, um, there are things like the golden rule. Do, do as you would be done by. Do unto others as you would that they would do unto you. That's ancient. That's, that appears in most religions. It appears in um, a secular moral philosophy. Um, it's, a, it's a philosophical point of view and it's one of several which we can all sit down and agree would be a good thing. We want to live in the kind of society where people be nice to each other, where, where people do to, to us what we would, um, what, what, where people do, do, do to each other what we would wish. Um, so we, we all have this shared common task of not only being good to each other, but trying to work out where that goodness comes from. Secular moral philosophers have been doing that for centuries and we can, we can read them. The only point I keep trying to stress is that it's a problem that we all share mm -hmm. because religion most certainly is not the answer. Not only should it not be the answer, but actually it isn't the answer. Mm. Das verstehe ich schon. Ja. Ich möchte auch gar nichts mm. dagegen sagen. Es ist eine ernst gemeinte Frage. Mm. Wie machen wir das? Ja. Also ich höre jetzt, ähm, dass Sie zum Beispiel Diskursethik für wahrscheinlich ein, ein sinnvolles Instrument halten. Well, uh, I, I think that Darwinian natural selection may give us some sort of origin for it. I think there's some evidence that from our ancient Darwinian heritage we have something like, something that could be turned into uh, the golden rule. Yeah. Um, so part of it comes from there, but I think that's only a small part of it. I think, uh, th I think a lot more of it comes from cultural development, cultural evolution, historical uh, changes as we go through history, we gradually change. Not so gradually, I mean, well, no, not so slowly anyway, actually quite, quite fast. Um, it is, it, I think it is quite remarkable how um, this, what I call the shifting moral zeitgeist, is, is, is a real phenomenon. I mean, if you go back um, say a hundred years from now, uh, you would find racism absolutely endemic in the whole of Europe. So it was, it came to the fore with Hitlerism in Germany, but it was very, very strong in Britain and France, Ireland. Uh, it was strong in Europe generally. There was an anti-Semitism, which was pretty much universal. Um, there was an anti-black, black people were regarded as sort of quaint. And, and rather childlike and to be, to be patted on, on the head. Um, and nowadays we've completely lost that. So we've, we've advanced, we've mm -hmm. progressed. I am fascinated by where that progression comes from. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very real phenomenon and we all need to try to understand why it is. I mean, let's take an, an, another example. Um, in, the, in the recent um, wars like the Iraq, um, the two Iraq wars, um, with very sophisticated weapons, there was very, very strong um, concentration on the need to avoid killing civilians. Now, it didn't always work, but there was a lot of concentration on building really smart weapons that only hit military targets, very sophisticated weapons that, that, that and if they accidentally hit civilian targets, it was a tremendous political um, uproar. Go back to the Second World War, and you have carpet bombing of Dresden, of Coventry. People didn't give a damn about civilians. It was, it was accepted that civilians were, 
were fair game. That is a major shift in the moral zeitgeist. Mm. Um, and, that, and it's that that we, both of us, all of us, need to try to understand because it's, in a way, very encouraging. Mm. Gibt es um, so Vorbildgestalten, religiöse oder nicht religiöse, die da auch helfen können? Also, ich bringe jetzt trotzdem das Beispiel Jesus um, oder Buddha oder es müssen nicht unbedingt religiöse Personen sein, aber so, an denen man sich auch orientieren kann. I think that it's it's always good to look at historical figures that one admires and who and who have um, great moral moral teachings and and Jesus and Gautama Buddha uh, would be two of them. Confucius would be another. Um, Mahatma Gandhi would be another. Martin Luther King would be another. Albert Schweitzer would be another. Um, there are. Uh, quite a quite a uh, quite a few ad admirable characters. I just t tossed off a few like that. I mean, we could mention Bertrand Russell, among more secular Thomas Paine, uh, Thomas Jefferson. You you can certainly look among the great philosophers and thinkers of the past for role models, um, but they were, were of course were of their time, and so they um, they even they would be left behind by the, the shifting moral zeitgeist. Sie haben einmal gesagt, ich fand das interessant, Sie haben gesagt, ich glaube, das war so in einer Radioshow, wenn Sie jetzt nur eine begrenzte Anzahl Musikstücke auf eine Insel mitnehmen könnten, dann wäre eines davon sicher die Arie Mache dich mein Herz rein. Das ist eine Arie aus Bachs Matthäus Passion. Und da habe ich mir schon die Augen gerieben und gesagt, warum jetzt ein religiöses Werk? Beautiful music. Uh, it, you might as well say, how can you read fiction when you know it's not really true? Um, fiction can be very, very moving. Um, as, it, as it happens in the case of Bach, it's the music that I find moving and the, the, the words I find less moving. But even if the words were moving, that wouldn't mean that I thought them true. Uh, I can be moved by, um, by a, a piece of, by a novel, by a fiction, mm. by a play, um, by a film. Um, I don't have to believe it's true. So Nein, natürlich nicht. Aber jetzt gerade im Fall von Bach. Wäre Bach ein Atheist gewesen, hätte er wahrscheinlich diese Musik nicht komponiert. If Bach had been an atheist, he might have written the, create, the um, evolution oratorio. Uh, he might have written um, um, the, uh, the dinosaur cantata. Um, <laughs> Aber wäre das auch solche Musik gewesen? It, would, it might have been even better. Ich, ich meine das jetzt irgendwie gar nicht, gar nicht lächerlich, sondern ähm, Bach hat am Ende der meisten Kompositionen äh, die Buchstaben S, D, G geschrieben, also Soli, Deo, Gloria. Er hat wirklich zur Ehre Gottes komponiert. Und Sie sagen, ja, früher, da waren halt die Künstler, die mussten ja von irgendwas leben und die Kirchen waren die besten ähm, Arbeitsgeber. Natürlich haben die es auch für Geld gemacht, aber glauben Sie nicht, dass es ähm, so also dieses Gefühl für etwas, das einen selbst übersteigt, Musik zu machen oder eine Kirche zu bauen oder was immer, dass das doch die Leute zu Werken angespornt hat, die sie vielleicht jetzt in einem ganz säkularen Kontext nicht zustande gebracht hätten? Very possibly. I mean, I'm not for a moment denying that Bach was a devout Christian. Of, co of course he was. Bach lived before Darwin. How could he not be a devout <laughs> Christian? It's ridiculous to suggest that. Um, no, of, of course Bach was genuinely moved, and of course religion does genuinely move people to produce great works of art, great music, great, great ceilings to chapels, um, great stained glass windows, um, great poetry. There's no question about that. Um, that doesn't make it true. And moreover, who knows uh, what Bach and, and Handel and, and Beethoven might have produced if they had, it had modern science as inspiration um, to work from. It could have been even better. <laughs> Vielleicht. Wir kommen bald schon zum Schluss unseres Gesprächs. Ich möchte den Kreis schließen, indem ich doch noch mal auf die Schöpfungsliga zu sprechen komme. Um, Jetzt einfach so als Gedankenspiel, gibt es eine Vorstellung davon, wie sich die Evolution weiterentwickeln wird? Also ähm, man hat ja manchmal, nee, wir wissen heute, wir sind natürlich nicht der Endpunkt. 
verzögerte Entwicklung und es ist auch nicht auf den Menschen zugelaufen. Aber wie geht das weiter? Können Sie da zum Schluss ähm, etwas dazu sagen? No, indeed. Um, it's, a, it's very important to understand that, that, that there never is an end. It, it goes on because the evolution is not a is not a ladder advancing towards man. Evolution is a branching tree, a branching bush, and there are millions of ends so far, and each one of those ends so far may go on, just the way a tree does go on. And so, um, we, you could ask that question of any one of those things. You could say, what's going to be the future of kangaroo evolution? What's going to be the future of, of um, warthog evolution? Um, if you're specifically asking the question, what's going to be the future of human evolution? Human evolution is probably a rather unusual in that humans have become so detached from the cutting edge of natural selection. We are now so cushioned, feather-bedded by medical science. It's got rather hard to die young. And so the survival of the fittest um, has a less urgent ring to it. We all, most of us, survive long enough to reproduce. So human evolution is a rather special case. Um, if you say, what's the world of life going to be like in 10 million years' time, in 20 million years' time, um, we can sort of answer that by looking back at what happened previously. So when the dinosaurs went extinct, which was 65 million years ago, nobody could have foreseen what was going to happen in detail, but they could have foreseen that the shoes of the dinosaurs would have been filled by something else. It turned out to be mammals. Perhaps we couldn't have foreseen that. It turned out to be mammals who stepped into the shoes of all the different kinds of dinosaurs. So the same range of carnivores and herbivores, large, medium and small carnivores, large, medium and small herbivores, etc. That's what I would, that's as far as I would go in predicting. In 10 million years time, there may well be a, an extinction of most of the life forms that we see today. There may be no humans, no lions, no elephants, no rhinoceroses, no cats. But there will be something which fills the same roles. It'll be, in a way, the same play, but with different actors. Richard Dawkins, ich danke Ihnen ganz herzlich für das Gespräch. Thank you very much.